let's take our Bibles tonight and open up to the book of Nahum. That is one we don't go to a whole lot. The book of Nahum. We continue in our series of messages on the three sixteens of Scripture. Last week we were in the book of Joel. And as you look at the Bible, we're skipping some. And the reason that we are skipping some books of the Bible is because there's no 316. So we're not able to go to it. So find the book of Nahum, chapter 3, if you will. And I will be the first one to admit as we're in this series of the 316s and we are looking at God's plan of love and redemption, this is one that's a hard one to wrap your head around because it does not sound in the least little bit like God's plan of love and redemption. In Nehemiah chapter 3 and verse 16, it says, Thou hast multiplied thy merchants above the stars of the heaven. The canker worm spoileth and flieth away. And there's not a thing that sounds positive about that verse, right? And you're absolutely right. If you look at that, you go, well, are you setting us up with this question? No, I'm not. I mean, this here, in fact, as we will see tonight in just a little bit, uh, this does not sound a whole lot like God's plan of love and redemption. Instead, what we hear, what we see is anger and destruction, the wrath of God poured out. But you say, well, how does that play a part in God's plan of love and redemption? And, and it does. It is part of it. And we like to, when we think about God's plan of love and redemption, we've got to wipe away all of our, our preconceived notions that it's this nice pretty little squeaky clean and everything's just you know you can put it in a hallmark card god's plan of love and redemption is a full package that includes a lot of different things and that's what we're going to see tonight so you we got to put this into context so keep a marker here in, in nahum go back to the book of jonah because we've got to go where the whole story begins we've got to travel back about a hundred years to a place called nineveh the book of nahum is written to a city uh, that is found here in Jonah chapter 3, about a hundred years after the events of the book of Jonah. So to set this up tonight, we're going to start in Jonah chapter 1, and the Bible says, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. Jump to chapter 3 and verse 1. The Bible says here, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. The city of Nineveh is an absolutely wicked, repulsive city. And Jonah has this message to go to these people and to tell them that, that God is about to judge them. As we look at God's plan of love and redemption tonight, God's plan of love and redemption declares a message of impending doom. God's plan of love and redemption declares a message of impending doom. If God did not love these people, he would not have had that message declared to them. In spite of a reluctant prophet, God gets the message to the Ninevites. They needed to know what they were about to experience from the hand of God, and it was not going to be pretty. Perhaps we ask, well, how in the world does this show God's plan of love and redemption? Put a marker here, if you will. We need one in Jonah. We need one in the book of Nahum. And let's go to the New Testament, Romans chapter 5. Let's apply this to you and I tonight. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, Romans chapter 5, verse 12, the Bible tells us here, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. And the Bible says here, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. That's a pretty unsavory lot there. 
Well, let's go to the book of the Revelation, chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21, and maybe as we look at this tonight so far, if you're here without the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, you're wiping the sweat off of your brow and you're saying, that ain't me. I don't fit into any of those things. Well, let me tell you something. Revelation 21 verse 8 will hit you. Revelation 21 says in verse 8, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. You mean to tell me that unbelieving people are just as bad and in just as bad of a predicament as the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and the idolaters and sorcerers? Yes. You cannot look at yourself and say, well, I may not be a believer, but at least I don't do those things. The unbeliever finds themselves in the exact same situation as those people. So tonight, the, the God's plan of love and redemption is going to declare a message of impending doom. You know, so much of what is considered the popular preaching today is what is the pretty preaching. It's the ultra-positive preaching that's out there. Uh, it's the flowery, motivational, full of platitudes and positivity. You've got characters like Joel Osteen that are out there preaching a, a message that is not a biblical message for starters but also declaring by his own words that he will not preach on hell and he will not preach on sin because he figures people feel bad enough about themselves. So he will not declare the message of impending doom that the Word of God says is supposed to be declared. Folks, that is a false teacher. That is a false teacher. By his rationale and the approval of the nearly 52,000 that attend his service and the millions that tune in and watch it on television or they tune in on XM satellite radio, they seem to like the positivity. Oh, it's, but it, I just feel so good about it and all this kind of stuff. But it isn't scriptural. And it doesn't follow the biblical mandate. The book of Isaiah 51 says, Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. You say, oh, absolutely. Israel needed that. Those Jews, were they were a mess, and we know that, right? And so we say, but that's Old Testament. Okay, I'll give you that. It is. So let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Let's bring it right down to where we live. Let's go to a New Testament passage. As you look at this New Testament passage, God's plan, His preaching outline is given. And He tells you this is how you do it. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. Preach the Word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. That is what the Apostle Paul tells this young preacher, Timothy, that that's what you're supposed to do when you get up and preach. So let's break this down just a little bit. First of all, he says, preach the Word. Don't be cutesy. It's not story time. It's not ha-ha time. It's not psychology time. It's not the latest and greatest book review time. This is a time for the preaching of the Word of God. When you stand in your Sunday school class, teachers, it is the time for you to preach the Word of God. When somebody comes into this pulpit, it is their time to preach the Word of God. That's what we are here for. If you want to read a book, fine, read it at home. But it is here that we preach the Word of God. Why? Because that's what the Bible says to do. And then he says, be instant in season and out of season. Let me tell you something. Preaching these days is more out of season than it's in season. There was a time, and you can look back into church history, and, and there are some great things that you can read about church history going back decades ago. And there was a time where, where the preaching of the Word of God was more in season. There was a time where an evangelist could come to town, and they erected a tent, and people would come from miles and miles away for weeks to hear the preaching of the Word, and people came under conviction, and they fell on their faces before God, and they got saved. And this is not the day and the age that it happens in the United States of America. Why, we're too busy. Why, we've got all these other things scheduled, you know. I don't have time for revival. It doesn't fit neatly into my day timer. It doesn't fit neatly onto my calendar. And we have become a nation where the preaching of the Word of God is out of season. It's also become a time where the preaching of truth is out of season. 
You know, our world today has no clue what truth is and has decided to believe lies and to make the lies the new truth. And whatever the narrative is that the loudest voices want to sing, people will believe it. But if you become a voice of a minority telling what the Bible says, and that is a minority voice, it's not something that wants to be heard. Preaching is out of season. Well, preach the word, instant in season and out of season. The first thing is reprove. There's a particular reason for the order. Reprove. Tell them what's wrong. That's the, the, a simple definition of what it means to reprove. Rebuke. Tell them what the penalty is of what's doing, uh, what you're doing is wrong. Tell them what the penalty is associated with it. Exhort. Tell them how to get it right. With all long suffering, patiently keeping at it, and with doctrine. It goes right back to the preaching of the Word of God, systematically teaching what the Bible says. This is why I get into series. Series? That's not, that's not grammatically correct. You know what I mean. That's why I get into them, like going through the book of Nehemiah, going through 1 John, going through a book of the Bible, because you need to systematically study the Word of God, verse upon verse, precept upon precept, line upon line. You've got to know what the Word of God says. And that's what we're here to do. I, at least that's what I'm here to do. How about you? God's plan of love and redemption sounds out the warning declaring the impending doom. God's plan of salvation and His plan of love and redemption does something else. It delays when repentance is present. It delays when repentance is present. Let's go back to the book of Jonah, chapter 3. Jonah, chapter 3, starting in verse 5. Jonah has given this message. The reluctant prophet of God has told the people what God is about to do. Verse 5, so the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe uh, from him and covered him with sackcloth and satin ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them. And he did it not. Even though we don't have a Jonah 3.16... We clearly see God's plan of love and redemption. This is a bunch of people who repented. They gave evidence of a broken, repentant heart, and God stayed His judgment against them. Look at Romans chapter 8 and verse 1 with me, if you would. Let this soak in for just a moment. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, the Bible tells you and I as believers in Christ that there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Do you realize this evening, we know that, that Nineveh was a wicked nation. Do you realize that every one of us came into the world with the exact same condemnation upon us that the Ninevites had? Now let that soak in. Say, oh, I wasn't, I'm not as bad as them. I didn't do things like that. My sins weren't as bad as their sins. That is absolute nonsense to say something like that. That is evidence you don't know what the Bible says. You are just as guilty, I am as just as guilty of an individual as the Ninevites. And if I had not accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior, I would be on my way to an eternity in hell. And if the Ninevites had not trusted in the coming Messiah, they would have been on their way to an eternity in hell. But they turned, and they gave their lives to Christ, that coming Messiah, the anointed one that was to come. When we repented and we believed the gospel, the grace of God was applied to our lives. The blood of Jesus Christ covered our sins, and the verdict of condemnation was lifted. Isn't that awesome to think about that? I am no longer under condemnation. Those Ninevites, regardless of what they had done, they were no longer under condemnation. Because the coming blood of Jesus was going to cover their sins. You know, you would think that any Christian 
would just about do cartwheels over something like that, wouldn't you? Not Jonah. Jonah chapter 4. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a, a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repentest thee of evil. He was upset that God had showed love and grace and mercy to those people. And I know we read that and we think, that's crazy. Yeah, it is. But I'm asking you tonight, I want you to look deep down into your heart. Do you feel the same way about somebody maybe that's sitting in a prison somewhere and, and they have got a death sentence on them because of murders that they have committed and that Jesus Christ could save their soul and redeem them and they, they may be under the condemnation of the state, but they are no longer under the condemnation of the kingdom of God. Does that bother you? Does it bother you tonight to know that an individual that has lived a homosexual lifestyle, that they can come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, and Jesus Christ breaks the chain of sin in their life, and they are no longer under condemnation? The alcoholic who just pounded one down after another and couldn't see straight on any weekend much less during the week. The Lord Jesus Christ got a hold of their soul. He changed their life completely, and they're now no longer under condemnation. Oh, and here we sit and we say, oh, I grew up in a Christian home, and it was just as squeaky clean as it could be. You were under the exact same condemnation as those individuals, and had it not been for somebody sharing Jesus Christ with you, you would have went to a sinner's hell with the unbelieving and the abominable and the whoremongers and the sorcerers and all those other people that are mentioned. But we rejoice tonight in the salvation of Jesus Christ. Delays. God's plan of love and redemption delays when repentance is present. Now let's go to the book of Nahum. Things are going to change in the next hundred years. And we're not really told why the change happened. But in the next hundred years, a new generation or two has taken over. The generation that repented is long gone. And now we've got a generation of people that have gone right back to the old ways. In the book of Nahum, chapter 1, the first two verses, the burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkishite. God is jealous, the Lord revengeth, the Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on His adversaries, and He reserveth wrath for His enemies. Jump to verse 9. What do you imagine against the Lord? He will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. For while they be folded together as thorns, and while they are drunken as drunkards, they shall be devoured as stubble, fully dry. Chapter 3, the first four verses. Woe to the bloody city. It is all full of lies and robbery. The prey departeth not. The noise of a whip and the noise of the rattling of the wheels and of the prancing horses and of the jumping chariots the horseman lifteth up both the bright sword and the glittering spear, and there is a multitude of slain and a great number of carcasses, and there is none end of their corpses. They stumble upon their corpses because of the multitude of the whoredoms of the well-favored harlot, the mistress of witchcrafts that selleth nations through her whoredoms and families through her witchcrafts. Wow! In a hundred years, this is what we've become. In a hundred years... A nation that had repented and God stayed His hand of judgment has become that. That is incredible to see something like that happen. Or have we seen it? Are we watching it? You go back and you look at our American heritage, and it is a Christian American heritage. I'm not saying that all those... People back there were Christians, but they had and, and lived upon a biblical, moral-based value system. And, and many of them, many of them were so bold in their proclamation of the Lord and their dependence upon God. The necessity that they saw for the nation to stay strong with the Lord. And look where we are today. Boy, we have come such a long way, haven't we? And not for the good. And you see places like Nineveh, 
You see places like Sodom and Gomorrah. And you say, how long, O Lord, how long? And I know maybe there are some that are uh, of a a liberal-minded spirit that'll say, well, how in the world could a loving God do that to the Ninevites? How could a loving God destroy them? How could a a loving God send anybody to an eternity in hell? That's not a loving God. There is no plan of love and redemption there. Yeah, there is. You see, there's two ways to look at this. First of all, the Bible promises, John's gospel promises, that the Lord will draw all people to himself. People still have a decision to make, but he will draw, he will convict. So much so that Romans chapter 1 and verse 21 says that everybody is without excuse. Nobody can point a finger at anybody else, and they certainly can't point a finger at God and say, it's your fault that I'm in hell. So why are people in hell? Did God send them there? There's two ways to look at that. The first is, no, God didn't send them there. They sent themselves. But the second way to look at it is, yes, He did, because isn't He the one that says, depart from me, I never knew you? But it's because the individual gave Him no choice. They gave Him no choice. When the Lord has clearly laid out the plan of salvation, the plan of redemption, the plan of love that is in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and humanity has has thumbed their nose at it and says, we can do better than that. It isn't God's fault when He has to stay honest and true to His Word. He is being faithful. It is God's plan of love and redemption. It's God's plan of love and redemption to you and I that know Christ as Savior. You know, every lost person that is in hell, they had their chance. They had their chance because our God is a faithful God to have called them and say, oh, but what about the heathen out there that didn't know and blah, blah, blah. You know, the Bible says in the Psalms that the heavens declare the glory of God. It's amazing because as individuals from that which is put within their heart from conception, the image of God stamped upon them, there is something inside the individual that says, There's something far greater than me. Maybe I don't know what it is. But you've got the scriptures and acts like Cornelius, and he was doing the best that he could. He was searching. The Lord was working on his heart. Who does God send to him? He sends him an evangelist, doesn't he? The evangelist gets the job done. God sent a missionary to him. God gets the job done. God sent a preacher to him. God gets the job done. God could have sent... Just a lay person that knew the Lord Jesus Christ that was willing to tell him about Jesus. God would have got the message to him. Tonight, when we look at something like Nahum, and we see how God destroys that city. Here's something, if you're sitting here tonight and you don't know Jesus Christ as Savior, and you say, oh, not today, maybe later. Our God's a God of second chances. Don't you love that? Our God is a God of one. He owes nothing more than one. Yes, it's true. He may give multiple opportunities, but He also knows exactly what you're going to do with those opportunities. And He says to Nineveh, you had your chance. You blew it. You're going to be destroyed. There was no second chance. Do we realize tonight that there are people in our world that will have one opportunity to know Christ as Savior. And that's it. The Spirit of God will not always strive with man. You and I as believers in Christ, we can't save a single person that's out there. It's not our job. That is the Spirit of God's job. Our job is to take the message. Whether they accept it or they reject it, that is their decision, but that's between them and God. All that is on our shoulders tonight is to take the message. God's impending doom is a message of His love because He's warning. The willingness to stay His judgment, that is a message of God's love and redemption. But the fact that God will not hold back forever. Yes, we have a long-suffering, loving Savior, but He will not hold off forever. The day of His judgment's coming. The day of His wrath is about to be poured out. Tonight, believers in Christ... We're going to be out of here. 
we are looking forward to the rapture. But if you're sitting here without Jesus Christ as your Savior, and the rapture trumpet sounds, you will be left behind. Oh, I'll get it right then. Not according to 2 Thessalonians, you won't. A strong spirit of delusion will be sent your way. You'll believe the lie. You say, oh, I'd never believe that. How many lies are people believing today? Oh, that's another sermon. But I tell you what, when you hear the gullibility of humanity today and the lies that people will believe and they will suck up, they'll believe anything. They will believe anything. 2020, 2020 showed us just how easy it's going to be for Antichrist to move in and to take control of everything. I don't know that we really realized how easy it was going to be. I didn't. Uh, it's going to be a piece of cake. And here's something else to consider. When that happens, the influence, the working of the Holy Spirit has been removed from the ch because the church has been removed, how much easier is it going to be? How much easier? Now is the time to get things right with the Lord. Christian, now is the time to get surrendered everything to the Lord. Will we do that tonight? Stand with me, please, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Heavenly Father, tonight, you know the hearts of those that are here this evening. And if there is one here without Jesus Christ as Savior, may they clearly see the danger that they are in. But at the same time, may they also clearly see the Savior that wants to rescue them from that danger. Tonight, Lord, we humbly ask that some lost soul, that this would be the night of salvation, that a child of God would get things right in their life. Have your way in this invitation, we pray and ask in Jesus' name.